Let's remain standing as we pray. Lord God, we ask that you would work a miracle this morning, that you'd work a miracle in causing us to leave this place no longer terrified by your justice, but thrilled by your justice. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please do take a seat. I'm preaching from two full chapters this morning, but I'm using just four words. Four words are all you'll need to get a hang of these chapters, all you'll need to remember. Injustice, worship, justice, and response, or responses, as we'll see. Four words. So please turn back to Revelation 15 and 16. You'll need it in front of you. Uh, not all of the verses, just a selection are on the screen this morning. Page 1244 of the Church Bibles. And we'll be going at, at some pace through, through this. So firstly, injustice. We've all heard the cry of a child. It's not fair. It's not fair. Maybe you've even heard that already this morning. Maybe from a child, maybe from a grown-up. It's not fair. And they're right. Life is not fair. Life in this world is not fair. Too often, criminals escape justice. Corporate greed goes unpunished. War crimes are forgotten. Abuses are covered up. We live in a world that cries out, for justice. Hurt people want relief. The bullied want fairness. The pushed around want dignity. Life is not fair. When will God do something about this injustice? When will God do something about this injustice? These chapters give us an answer. The book of Revelation as a whole reveals to us what is really happening in our world. It enables us to have fresh perspective on the story so far. And it enables us to see the end of the story before a glorious new beginning. Our second word, worship. And what John sees in chapter 15, verses 2 to 4, is a vision of worship. The victorious and vindicated people of God celebrating his justice. Those who have come through fiery trials and have remained faithful. Look at verse 2 onwards with me. And I saw what looked like a sea of glass, glowing with fire, and standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast and its image and over the number of its name. They held harps given them by God and sang the song of God's servant Moses and of the Lamb. And the song that's then sung gives us, it helps us to understand the message of the narrative that, that surrounds it. The lyrics of the song are developed from the worship of ancient Israel in the Exodus and in the Psalms, but now praising God for his greater deliverance in Christ. So as I read it again, just look down at the at the words of the song. Do you see how God is praised for who he is and for what he's done? His character and his actions. Verse three. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. It is vital for us to understand and to celebrate the justice of God. That God's kingdom is a kingdom of justice. Because human kingdoms are typically built upon injustice. Rule that is unjust is very shaky. 
Empires built on injustice and oppression eventually fall, even if it takes centuries. They eventually fall either from corrosion within or from reaction without. But God's built kingdom is built on true justice and so will never fall. And note too in these verses that it's God's character that's being celebrated, not simply his actions. And let me just as a little aside here say that that is really important for us pastorally, for you and I. Because sometimes we will not understand the specific actions of God. We will have questions, inevitably. We will have questions about God's actions. But in those questions that we have, from our limited viewpoint, we can know that God's actions always flow from his character. And he is good. And he is just. The God of the earth will do right. And so in whatever questions you may have, you can know that God's actions always flow from his character. And you may not understand his actions, but you can trust his character. And so too, we see in these verses yet again that God's kingdom is a global kingdom. He's the king of the nations, and all nations will come and worship before him. Ian Paul writes this, which I love. This makes the multinational identity of the people of God in the new covenant a reason for worship and not simply the result of worship. God's wonderful deeds and righteous acts are revealed in the coming of him to all tribes, languages, tongues, and people. So as we're here worshiping this morning, praise God because all nations are here worshiping the king of the nations. What a privilege that is. What a great place to be. What a great family to be part of. A glimpse of glory. Our third word is justice. We're not halfway through the sermon, by the way. We're just halfway through the words. Our third word is justice. And we're going to spend longer on this third word, justice. Because the majority of the chapters 15 and 16 are taken up with descriptions in very vivid terms of God's judgment upon the injustice of this world. So verse 1 of chapter 15 begins, I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with the seven last plagues. Last because with them God's wrath is completed. And then over to the beginning of chapter 16, then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go, pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. So what's happening here? Well, in the plagues and in the bowls, God's, God's uh, revelation gives us yet another viewpoint, another viewpoint upon the judgment of God that we've already seen expressed in the trumpets and the seals, for example, previously. So we, we could kind of have to understand that we're not intended to read these judgments sequentially in a chronological sense. But neither is it quite like, it's not quite like a cycle going round and round the same events in exactly the same way. It's not, it's not quite like that either. Rather, try and think of it more like a descending spiral. A descending spiral. Viewpoints of the judgment of God throughout time which culminate in the final judgment at the end of history as we know it. And as we arrive at the bowls, we get a much greater sense of finality and fullness. And someone has described the seven trumpets in previous chapters as being like a, an incomplete snapshot, whereas with the bowls, you get a fuller photograph. Now, of course, many people don't like to talk about God being a God of judgment. Even us as Christians, we sometimes prefer to think of God as being, well, more like, Father Christmas, gentle grandfather kind of figure in the sky. But such Santa Claus theology isn't found in the Bible. 
because such a theology can't cope with the reality of evil and suffering. Such a God could do nothing about injustice. And I asked last week, whose ears are you listening to Revelation through? Well, this week, can I ask you to try to view, to see Revelation 15 and 16 from God's perspective through his eyes? James Hamilton writes, none of us is just like God. None of us is holy like God. But we all know how we would feel and how we would respond if someone treated us the way the world has treated God. We would feel a righteous indignation. Transpose the righteous indignation you would feel into perfect holiness. Multiply it by all the sins of all the people who have ever lived or ever will. And we can begin to understand why Revelation 16 is in the Bible. And as we enter chapter 16, the bowls of God's wrath are poured out on the earth. And you might have recognized as it was read that some of these resonates with the, the, the plagues of Egypt during the plagues upon Egypt during the Exodus. See if you can pick that up just as I read a couple. Verse 2 of chapter 16. The first angel went and poured out his bowl on the land, and ugly, festering sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it turned to blood like that of a dead person, and every living thing in the sea died. The third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. Have you ever prayed the Lord's Prayer? Raise your hand if you've ever prayed the Lord's Prayer, either together or alone. The familiar words, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Do you realize how dangerous it is to pray that prayer? A very dangerous prayer to pray. We prayed that prayer actually as we were recording yesterday for the, for the BBC Radio 4. But it's a very dangerous prayer to pray. Why? Well, because when we pray, your kingdom come, we are praying and all other kingdoms go. And we're praying not just that cruel evil would go, but that convenient evil would go. Convenient evil where God is just sidelined or ignored. Your kingdom come is quite a prayer to pray. And God answers prayer, but sometimes with a, sometimes with a long wait. And these chapters are the answer to the prayers prayed earlier in Revelation. Look with me at verse 5 of chapter 16. Then I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, you are just in these judgments, O holy one, you who are and who were. For they have shed the blood of your holy people and your prophets, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. And I heard the altar respond, yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. You know, when we pray for the church that is under suffering, this is the ultimate answer to those prayers. When we pray for the church in danger of being deceived, this is the ultimate answer to those prayers. And as the various bowls of God's wrath are poured out, we see God's judgment affecting, well, really, really it's many things that, that, that human beings, we tend to try and put our security in, whether it's economic systems, our military might, health and strength and well-being, or the politics of power and so on. And there's a very real sense in which this is played out throughout history. The Roman Empire, which so oppressed the first century Christians, was brought low, eventually. And all other empires which do the same either have been brought low or will be, including Western secular liberalism. 
And so if you're wondering about Revelation and about all we've read so far in, in Revelation, if you're wondering, have these events already happened? Or are these events happening now? Or are these events still to come? Then the answer is yes, yes, and yes, in a way. And we need to understand that the crumbling, crumbling empires of the past and present are foretastes of a future final judgment of evil. And maybe you picked up, as, as we read, there is this growing sense of finality in these chapters. The calls to repentance and the warnings of judgment are receding, replaced by the sense of the, the complete establishment of the kingdom of God, the banishment of evil finally and forever. And many believers, many Christian believers, will face a long wait for the answer to the prayers for vindication and justice. And this calls for patient endurance. And throughout history, we will see many empires and nations come and go. And in the final analysis, God's kingdom will only fully come and other kingdoms finally go when the Lord Jesus returns in the future. And the finality that's expressed in verses 17 to 20 captures in very vivid terms the cataclysmic consequences upon the cosmos and upon civilization of the return of the Lord Jesus. Just have a look at those verses before we come back to some others. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air. And out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, it is done. Then there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since mankind has been on earth. So tremendous was the quake. The great city split into three parts and the cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. Every island fled away and the mountains could not be found. From the sky, huge hailstones, each weighing about 40 kilograms, fell on people. They cursed God on account of the plague of hail, because the plague was so terrible. The return of the Lord Jesus will bring God's justice in the fullest and final expression. I want to read to you now a story, a story that's told by a guy called Mark Menel. He works for the Langham Partnership. He lives in the UK now, but for several years, he worked and lived in Africa with his family. He was training church leaders and others. And I'm going to pick up this story in Mark's own words. It's taken from, from his excellent book called A Wilderness of Mirrors. He writes this. I was teaching in a small Uganda-founded seminary and particularly loved spending time with the students. It was such a privilege and was a huge learning experience. A number of our students were from the surrounding countries, Rwanda, Burundi, Sudan, as it then was, Democratic Republic of the Congo, and even Ethiopia. E even Ethiopia. To say that their stories were eye-opening is an understatement. The hardship and injustices they faced constantly challenged the complacent securities of home. The experiences of two Congolese men in particular have stayed with me. And then he refers to, to one friend just by his initial, M. M had been a banker in President Mobutu Zaire, Zaire, as the Congo was then called. The term kleptocracy, ruled by thieves, was coined for the regime. Because the president of that uniquely resource-rich land regarded the central bank as his personal reserves. His lackeys naturally followed suit. This made it a country where working as a banker could prove fatal. But when the Cold War ended and the West no longer needed its African bulwark against communism, Mobutu fell, 
and the country was plunged into even greater chaos. In the late 1990s, war became constant, with the country suffering its highest death toll since 1945. While the rest of the world seemed oblivious, the loss of perhaps five million lives provoked the conflict's bitterly ironic nickname, Africa's World War. M had to flee his home in Kisangani, eventually reaching Kampala with his wife and three daughters. They had seen close family members hacked to death with machetes. They had lost everything except the clothes they escaped in. They were refugees in an English-speaking country and so had to learn a fourth language. Before enrolling in our college, the family could only afford one room without power or water and one meal every two days with their refugees' allowance. I will never forget the day M and I found ourselves alone chatting in the college library. He smiled bravely as tears streamed down his cheeks. I had been told that African men don't cry. And eventually he said, Mark, I could never trust in God if it was not for judgment. For I know there will not and cannot be justice for us in this world. But this is key for making the Christian message good news for me. Mark, I could never trust in God if it wasn't for judgment. For I know there will not and cannot be justice for us in this world. But this is the key for making the Christian good message good news for me. Injustice. Worship. Justice. And the fourth word is response. Throughout Revelation, there are two very distinct responses to the justice of God. We might like to think that such stark warnings would finally turn even the hardest of hearts to the Lord. And that does happen in God's mercy. But look at the responses in verses 9 and 10 of verse 16, uh, chapter 16. Verse 9 They were seared by the intense heat and they cursed the name of God who had control over these plagues, but they refused to repent and glorify him. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, but they refused to repent. Even at that point, they refused to repent of what they had done. The disasters of history serve as a wake-up call and a warning. And the people of God witness faithfully, yet some still refuse to repent and turn to the living God, just like Pharaoh did, or didn't turn to the living God. I was watching an episode of, of, of Sherlock Holmes a few Christmases ago. And in that episode, Dr. Watson said of Holmes, he would try to outlive God in order to get the last word. He would try to outlive God in order to get the last word. Well, that's one response. And yet there is a second type of response. A type of response seen in God's people throughout the ages and in some horrifically difficult situations. And a response that's to be ours today. It's there in verse 15. Look, I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and remains clothed so as not to go naked and be shamefully exposed. Well, our response is to be watchful, remaining awake, a common New Testament metaphor for watching for the return of the Lord Jesus, ready for him. 
and our response is to be waiting because knowing that God will bring justice means that we can bless our enemies. Knowing that God will bring justice means that we can pray for our persecutors. It means that we can overcome evil with good. If, you, if, if the state has not brought you justice, then know that God will do in the end. And we don't need to seek revenge. Do you know that? Christians never, seek, Christians never need to seek revenge because justice will be done for every wrong, either justice on the last day or justice at the cross. Watchful, waiting, and worshipful. You know, this conviction that God will bring an end to injustice has found what one writer describes as an unshakable anchorage amongst Christians throughout the centuries and in the hardest of conditions. How? Well, one answer is this, as Eugene Peterson puts it. Worship provides the context for the paradoxical simul simultaneous... Uh, I can't say that word... Uh, happening at the same time, of believing in justice whilst experiencing injustice. Simultaneities, I think is how you say it. Believing in justice whilst experiencing injustice. Worship provides that context for holding that. And he continues, John was an exiled pastor with a responsibility for seven congregations of Christians who were subject to a barrage of violence and propaganda from without, who were being infiltrated from within by cunningly attractive, deceptive lies. And John can think of nothing better to do than to call them to worship. In a world in which we're constantly subjected to dizzying disorientation, worship is the act in which we are reorientated in our context. Worship is the essential and central act of the Christian. We do many other things in preparation for and as a result of worship. We sing, we write, we witness, we heal, we teach, we paint, we serve, we build, we clean, we smile, but the centering act is this, it is worship. Worship is the act of giving committed attention to the being and action of God. When we worship, it doesn't look like we're doing much, and we're not. We are looking to what God is doing and orienting our action to the compass points of creation and covenant, judgment and salvation. So here we are today, gathered for worship enabling us to live in a world of injustice, knowing that one day justice will be done, enabling us to worship. And shortly we'll be sharing the bread and the wine. Every human being will drink a wine, either the wine of God's wrath or the wine of that we're about to share, representing Jesus' blood who drank that cup of God's wrath for us. And so today, as we, we can worship as we drink that wine, no longer terrified by God and his justice, but thrilled with him. Let's bow our heads. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed.